Find Your Time Stories is brought to you by Mila Eve Essentials. Visit MilaEveEssentials.com for 100% pure therapeutic essential oils and other products. Nature knows best and so does Mila Eve. It's your boy DJ Richie Scott in the building with Monique Samuels and we are taking you behind the scenes of Binder Time Stories. We're about to get this binder time going, so it's gonna be good and funny. Like this rain need to go away. Give me a test one, two, three. Testing one, two, one, two, three. Testing. I'm gonna do all of my intros twice for each part. It's three parts, and then I'll go into it. All right, just tell me when to start. Gather around the fire, boss squad. I have a story to tell about some very evil women who wanted to see me in jail. Very evil women who wanted to see me in jail. Well, we're gonna have promos out of this for sure. <laughs> okay. All right, ready to go. I got a lot of questions. I know you got a lot of questions. And she got the answers. Oh, yeah. So, let's get to it. All right, let's do it. Why now with Binder Time Stories? I uh, want to know your thoughts about that. Why now? Because I wrote the first part two weeks after reunion, and it was that dope. I was like, I got I to gotta do something with this. And really, it's my closure. So, when I had the whole fight situation happen, uh, I wrote a song, Drag Queens, Got in the Booth. I'm a creative person. It was my way to just kind of let it out. It was my closure. Now that I've walked away from this amazing platform and people are like, you know, some people are like, why did you do it? Why did you leave? And some people are like, please come back. And some people are like, I get it. For me, this is my closure. So I know I made the right choice. Um, I'm confident in my decision. And I'm like, well, I might as well keep using this platform and make a little bit extra. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay. Speaking of leaving, can you tell me what you were doing and what you thought the moment you decided to leave? Oh, yes. So, the moment I decided, I was in Florida visiting my mom. And this is what's really funny. I had just watched the third part of the reunion, right? Which was Saturday before it aired. I got a visitor that day. I met up with Funky Dineva. Oh. Yeah, so we're, and he <laughs> never knew. He never knew. He could probably sense in my tone that I was really pissed, but he never knew that I was gonna walk away. But when he came over that day, and this is the first time I've even talking about this, so when he sees this, he's gonna be like, oh shoot. When he came over that day, I knew I was done. I knew I was done. Why, did he, did he say something? No. Or was it something in the conversation? Like what happened? It was just me watching that reunion, that third part. And that's when I was just like, I am done with this. It was just a hot mess because I didn't like the fact that they took my family and tried to make a mockery of it. Mm. You know, the disrespect, there were so many moments that led up to it. And then after I watched it, I said, you know what? It's one thing to fight against the women, but when you're fighting against the network and production, that's when you know it's time to go. Mm. And the way that they edit that last part, whether the fans and viewers that watched the show took my side or not, wasn't the issue. It was how I felt about it. Mm. And that's when I knew it was enough for me. And I remember him coming over and we're, and we're talking and chatting it up just about any and everything in general. And I was trying so hard to make sure that I didn't give it away. Cause I knew in that moment, I was like, man, I'm done. That next morning I woke up, I hadn't said anything to my family. All my family was in town. And I woke up and I said, I'm done. And I typed up an email to all of EPs and I hit save and draft. And I waited until 10.31 p.m. to send it after the reunion aired. Did, okay, so did you get a response back? Like what can, I mean? Nothing, no response. For about a week, I got a text message from one of the VPs from our show. Um, and he said, hey, just wanted you to know that everybody that could answer your email um, is out because of the holiday. Okay. But I knew that was complete BS because they were still working. I know of some cast members that were still talking to those same people. So I was like, oh, okay, all right, cool. And then it wasn't until two weeks later that I actually had a phone call and then I was finally released. 
Okay. Yeah. So there's that. Yeah. Now I want to go back a couple of weeks prior to the reunion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because the reunion I'm assuming was filmed maybe around November, October, somewhere around there. Mid-November. How, how, how far in advance were you putting together the binder? Oh, I actually did the binder the night before. Yeah, the night before I left for reunion. I had been talking about it. So I talked to, I talked about it to my husband. I talked about it to my project and household manager, Leaf. And I said, I'm gonna put a binder together and I'm gonna have a tag for everybody. And I went on Amazon and I purchased these beautiful binders probably <laughs> five days before. Okay. I, I'm a prime member, so I got them quickly. Okay. And I got my little tabs because this is the thing. I this is kind of like what I do. I'm a binder chick. I have binders for everything. So <laughs> it's it's not hard for me to put information together and organize it and throw it together in a book. I have the color coded tabs. I have like thousands of them. You can look in my office right now and see. We might need to do that. We might need to take the camera and let y'all check out all my I binders. Feel that like I feel like we should see the <laughs> binder station. Just so y'all know, I wasn't kidding. Yes, I have binders for everything. That's just my thing. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I sat right at my kitchen counter, printed out everything I needed to print out, and I just had everybody's tab, and I have a file saved on my computer for the eight tabs that you do when you want to print them out, make them look nice. That's how much I use binders, so it wasn't anything for me to do that. You know, and, and this is a technical question, because after your reunion, we actually saw another cast member on another show bring reunion receipts that were illegible. How did you, <laughs> I won't call a name, how did you know how to present all of this in such a an organized fashion? Because it's not, I'm sure it's not easy to go into a reunion not knowing what questions are gonna be asked mm -hmm. and then knowing this is where to go and this is what to pull out. How, how did that, the organization process come about? I'm naturally an organized person. I actually, so for people who don't know this, I had a full academic scholarship to Duquesne University uh, in Pittsburgh, P Pennsylvania. Uh, I went from high school as a salutatorian, graduated, had my full academic scholarship, and I went into their business law undergraduate program, which meant that my senior year of college would be my first year of law school. Mm. So I got accepted into this program. So I was supposed to be a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah, that was my, that was what I was going to school for. So some of those skill sets kind of came naturally. When I dropped out of school to pursue music, I was actually the executive assistant to my entertainment attorney who taught me everything she knew. So when it comes to being organized, I had firsthand training and then some of it is just kind of like who I am anyway. You did give us very law and order in that reunion. <laughs> now that I think back on it, I mean, the way you just so quickly opened it up, turned to the page and was like, this is the number. Right. <laughs> and I'm a person like this. I saw a bunch of lies being told and spread mm -hmm. every week, every week, every week after week. And I said, I'm not going to come with anything that I cannot back up. Mm. So any person that came my way, oh, I had something for you and I was gonna back it up. I do not spread rumors, I spread facts. So okay. I wanted to make sure I had all of my facts right there in the book, ready, and I was not playing. Was there anybody that you were really just ready for to come at you? And I'm like, I got you on page 103. Was there that person and did you have to say it and did it was it edited out or did that happen at all? The person who I was dead set ready for was the person who talked the most about me mm. behind my back. So we already know who that is. I'll just give you a hint. She got a real saggy neck and some really big angles. But um, I basically had the mindset. I knew that production and everybody else expected for this reunion to be about the fight. Mm. We already didn't talk about that fight. We done beat that fight into the head. We done did everything with that fight. I was over it. I didn't want to talk about it anymore. And I didn't have much else to say about it at the reunion other than here's my official apology for my actions mm -hmm. and I'm done with it. But what I did want to address was the fact that a person who had so much to say about me and my household was out here faking and fronting mm -hmm. for the whole church congregation and everybody else watching the show. And I said, if you want to come for me, I'm going to return the favor at reunion. She did it for 19 weeks and people said I came too hard at the reunion. And I'm like, no, I didn't. I met her where she met me. Mm. 
and just for her it just all happened at once it took her 19 weeks for me it took me one episode it took me 30 40 minutes and then everybody that witnessed it was just like oh maybe i should back off and they did i think <laughs> that the they part. saw the binder and probably figured i'll leave her alone today <laughs> yeah nobody came too hard after that and that was like right before lunch break and i mean it was like complete silence from her for hours Really? Yeah, yeah, until the men came out. Then my husband dug a, a ditch even deeper for her. <laughs> so then the reunion airs, you see part one, you see part two, you see part three. And then you make that decision. Did anybody reach out to you, like from the cast, like afterwards? Or did anybody suspect that you might be quitting? So initially, I thought and I just knew. I was like, they're probably going to fire me, whatever. But I think because the reunion took a turn that they weren't expecting, maybe they expected me to come in and be crying and, oh, I'm trying to beg my way back into the circle. And I just came in with my head held strong and high. And I said, you know, I don't care what mistake I make, I'm going to take accountability for it. And I'm still going to be me. You're never going to take away this confidence. Like there's nothing you can do. And I think that's what they were expecting for me to come in with my head held low. And I think that they just thought that they were going to just beat me some more. Mm. And I came in with my energy and I totally, I totally changed the tone right. and I handled every question. I mean, they were asking me questions like, why don't you vaccinate your kids? And I'm like, first of all, my kids were in public school. So in order to be in public school for all y'all geniuses out there, y'all know that they have to be vaccinated. So what are you talking about? Now you're making assumptions. Then it was like questions like, well, we saw T'Challa more than we saw your kids. That's not my call. That's production's call. I filmed with my kids just as much as I filmed with T'Challa. When I tell you they were coming at me from every different angle, asking me about my business. Well, why do you have Not For Lazy Moms and it's all about natural remedies? Because why don't we have an alternative to medicine? Can we have an alternative? Can we do some things that will encourage us? And my website's not just about natural remedies it's about maintaining yourself and it's yeah. about women who share and and for them to feel that they're not alone in this parenthood mm. journey and not even just women i have a strong following of men and also single people yeah. so it was just like i mean they were gunning at me and i don't think that they were ready for me to be as prepared but here's the thing when you're coming with the truth there's really nothing else that you can do but just be prepared because you know you're true. Right. So there was no rehearsal. There was no need to, you know, uh, have lines written out and, and have them ready. I'm just like, whatever you ask me, I'm going to give you exactly what it is. And they weren't ready for that level of realness. Wow. I know that Andy had asked for the binder previously so that he could put it into the, you know, Hall of Fame and watch what happens live. Is that something that you're still planning to send him? Like a, a, a version of the binder? Like what, what's going on with that? I'm just gonna say Richie hasn't seen part three yet. We'll just leave that there. Uh, oh, okay. Well, <laughs> there's that. So we'll we'll follow up with that later, okay? Um, <laughs> I can't wait to get your reaction after you watch the third I'm part. I'm interested too. Because my next question is this, if you, could say something to Andy, given that it seemed like leading up to the reunion, he seemed very supportive of you in terms of, you know, when you were on Watch What Happens Live, interviews and stuff like that. Right. Then there seemed to be a little bit of a switch when you guys got to the reunion, at least from a viewer perspective. Mm. And now following that, and again, I haven't seen part three yet, so stay tuned for that. But now removed from the situation and looking back on it, what would you say to him? I would say I'm a bit confused because I will say during the reunion, every time we had a break, Andy would come over to me and he would even say like, do you feel like you're being heard? I want to make sure that you're being, you know, able to voice mm -hmm. what, what it is you need to say. And I said, yes, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, because they had me sitting on the edge in the dark, <laughs> I could, I had a dead straight view on Andy okay. and he had the same on me. So I didn't have to raise my voice. I didn't have to argue with anybody. Every time I wanted to say something, I would look at Andy and I would kind of go like this. And he'd be like, oh, you want to say something? I'd be like, like that. And after everybody quieted, he would say, Monique, what do you have to say about that? So he gave me opportunities while we were filming to make sure that I felt as though I was being heard. Okay. So I appreciate that. Um, but the level of uh, 
judgment in some of the questions mm. that were being asked as far as like, oh, you seem stoic and you're not seeming like you are emotional and judging the way I responded to mm -hmm. something that happened over a year ago. You know, I didn't think that was cool, but in that moment, I did what I had to do. I answered the questions. Um, I've not heard from him since the day after reunion. We did talk um, a few times after the reunion over text message. Um, haven't heard from him since then. And then with everything being said, I thought that we had a cool enough relationship where he would like say something, but there's not been anything. But that's the thing about this business. The people who you think are your friends aren't. And um, that was one thing that I had to always remind myself of is that the people that I'm working with, even on production and the network, they're not your friends, you know, so they're your coworkers. Mm -hmm. So that's when it kind of brings everything back into perspective. And that's why I'm unbothered by it, because it's like, OK, I get it. And that, that, that is what it is. You know, that's something that also Nini had made reference to as well mm -hmm. about the ladies on the show being coworkers. Um, I want to ask you about that now. Then we want to get into the actual the the story that you're telling here but did anybody you know did you hear anything from anybody outside of Potomac um after you quit like did anybody oh, yeah. did any other housewives reach out and can you tell us who oh yeah definitely um I had a lot of people reach out a lot of support um I remember that night um Karen texted me and she was like what is going on <laughs> and I was like I'm about to go live I will call you back no she called me I'm sorry she said, what is going on? I said, I'm about to go live. I'll call you back. And then we text and I said, I'll talk to you about it tomorrow. And then the next day, Ashley texted me and she said, well, I, I was getting text messages at night and I just thought people were just making some things up. So I didn't bother you. She said, but did you really quit? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I really quit. She was like, wow. But she understood where I was coming from because once you become, especially when you become a mom, it's not just becoming a parent, but in that instance, me and Ashley could relate because she now understands like, wow, certain things are off limits. And now that she can see that for herself, I think she saw that in me as well. Mm -hmm. And she was actually proud of the stance that I took. Um, Portia reached out to me that night and she was just more like encouraging me like, no girl, you better not walk away, you can do this. And I was like, girl, I said, I ain't as strong as you when it comes to this. I'm good, I said, I'm done. And, and we talked for a while, and once she saw that I was pretty much resolved in my uh, stance, then she was like, all right, well, you know, I'm here. Um, I did talk to Bronwyn from OC. I talked to Leanne Locken from, uh, from Real Housewives of Dallas, formerly. Um, Hello. Yeah, I had a lot of people reach out, even over Twitter, text message, Dr. Simone from Married to Medicine. That's like my sister, so she reached out. And I mean, she's been reaching out along the whole way. She's awesome. been there for me along the whole journey. She's probably the person who I talk to the most. Mm. And um, we've had a beautiful friendship form from being on the platform. Mm. So, so yeah, it, it was it was a great outpouring of people just showing love and support and, and understanding. So, yeah. yeah. So getting into the story that we're telling now, Binder Time Stories, how did you decide to craft this? And how did you decide how many parts to make this? <laughs> so initially, I wanted to have a part for each tab in the binder. Okay. And I was gonna have a part for each person or character that I would be uh, referencing mm -hmm. and creating. But then the further and further I got away from the reunion, the less and less I cared. And I was just like, all right, well, I have two and a half parts written, so maybe I'll just leave it at three. And you know, you just get to that point where you're just kind of over it. Okay. But because I had so many people reaching out, I'm talking about constantly, they're like, um, can you go ahead and scan that binder and like post the PDF online? We want to see the binder. And it kept happening over and over again. They're like, can you figure out a way, give us something. I would be on my Tiwa Monique channel and people are like, give us binder time stories. I'm like, okay, let me think about this. So initially, I was going to do it as almost like a, an adult bedtime story. So I envisioned myself like in pajamas, sitting in the bed and I'm reading this story. And then it hit me later as I'm developing the story more and more. I wrote the first part in like 40 minutes. I let my husband hear it. One of my best friends was in town, Anisha. I let her hear it. Everybody loved it. So I was like, okay. I said, you know what? I remember having a moment at a fire pit and it didn't go the way I wanted it to go. So this was the way that- I remember that. I, yes. So I said, this will be good if I do it at the fire pit. 
because it's an extension of what should have been talked about that night, keeping it real. So, let me just go ahead and break that down. Yes. In the episodes, in the season of season five, you wanted to have a conversation at the fire pit. Yes. You had two other characters who were inside three. having, oh, three other characters inside having a, having a conversation that pretty much took over that other scene at the fire pit. Yes. Is, okay, I just wanted to, yes. for people to understand what was really going on. Yes. And so can you explain that setup real quick and, and why you felt the way you felt that night? Yes, so the whole reason that I invited the ladies out to my home in Newburgh, number one, Newburgh is very peaceful. It is hard to have an argument out there because you're at one with nature and it just, it's very relaxing. And I said, you know what? We should all just come together and let's just like reintroduce ourselves, like on some Jay-Z type stuff. Like, allow me to reintroduce myself. We have met and it's been how many years and look how much we've changed. So let's like burn, let's burn the hatchet. Let's like let it burn. Let's do whatever session we need to do. If we, if we need to roast each other, let's roast each other. And let's roast some marshmallows and make s'mores while we're doing it at the same time. So that was my plan. And that was the whole uh, tone of the whole weekend. Mm. And we had not gotten there yet. So I was very adamant, like, all right, this is a moment that I want. Any other time that anybody hosts anything, I am down. Eight months, nine months pregnant, belly out to here, I'm down for you. Whatever you tell me to do, you go sit over there, stand up, clap, dance, I'm doing it. So now I'm hosting, and I know how much work I put into it and, and my whole team when we were trying to get the house ready. So I'm like, okay, this is my trip. Now let's go back to the first trip I had at France. I had events planned, everybody didn't show up. So I'm being triggered. So I'm like, okay, why is it that when I'm trying to plan something special, there's no respect there? Nobody mm. shows up where they're supposed to be. Like, there's no respect, especially when I'm like, we got free time, do what you want to do. And then it's nothing but complaints. So it was very annoying. So I said, you know what? When I did Binder Time Stories and I decided to have it at the fire pit, I said, this would be a continuation of what should have happened that night. I should have roasted all of them tricks right then. <laughs> now, I won't call all of them tricks. I like Karen and Ashley. <laughs> Speaking of which. <laughs> now, in part one of this story, Okay, we get a little teaser about, it sounds like one of the ladies who are pictured, and I, I gotta pause right there real quick. Who came up with the images? We gotta talk about the, there's so much to break down. There's, there seems to be imagery that, that corresponds to each character on the show, <laughs> but we don't know who they are. Now you give us this, really good clue about getting uh, wanting some numbers or so you know who came up with the images okay i came up with the names okay so we have monique popoff which is obviously me mm -hmm. then we have the madame we have the misery we have the chef we have the sleeping pill we have <laughs> um weep weep and we have Celsius, who loves to tell the temperature of day. 40 degrees, so yeah, so we have those characters. I came up with the names myself. And my brother came up with the visuals. Okay. And there was only one request. No, there was two requests that I made. I wanted Weep Weep to look more like the age that she acted. And then I wanted for, um, the misery, I want it for her to have this invisible person in her character picture that was there, but was not there. Mm. Let it be a man, since mm. those men, the men are always interchangeable. Mm. So if you look closely at the misery's image, you'll see this kind of like disappearing man. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. And so then the you gotta look, look closely. You gotta look closely. Okay. You gotta like look real close. And you'll see it. And then I wanted to make sure that the neck was not so perfect because, you know, some of us have wrinkled necks. Not me, my neck is, my neck is up to par. There is a little surgery for that. But what I will say <laughs> is this, the chef, and, and what I wanted to know about the chef, because I'm still, I'm still, who is the chef? 
The chef is my favorite. She can stir up a pot. Enough The said. misery's first target <laughs> when she called her a thought. Enough said. Yes. And I think what I, what I like about this is that the clues are there within the context of the show. Yeah. Like you really pulled from the show. I use the show as inspiration for my fiction story tale. <laughs> I, okay, there's that, there's that. Yes, it definitely inspired the whole entire binder time. And it's also a summation of just my time on the show. Even certain things that I kind of point out as we leave um, the discussion of the women. So when we look at part one, when I start talking about the gatekeepers in charge, watching us step by step, watch out, don't be punished, don't disrespect that little check. Um, we're placed into positions like crabs in a pot scandalous schemes and plotting just to get to the top. In this world, the top's reserved for the most wicked of all. But even the wicked give them up just to watch them fall. That is not just talking about the show. We are placed into positions like crabs in a pot, scandalous schemes and plotting just to get to the top. In this world, the top's reserved for the most wicked of all. But even the wicked get built up just to watch them fall. That That's is also talking about society. Yeah. You know, a lot of times we'll look at, oh, we want to be down. We want to be a part of this group. We want to be a part of that. And then you start to realize, whoa, some of those people traded their souls to be in those positions. Mm. And they appear as though they're at the top. Mm. But they're going to fall just like all the other wicked people fall, you know? So and it's I, like, watch what you ask for. I feel like ultimately there's always... In your opinion, is there always an encouragement for there to be this villain that just makes all the magic happen? Or are there instances where there's not? And, and people are just really living their lives? Well, I can definitely say from firsthand experience, I was painted as a villain without my consent. Mm. You know, so I think that some of the actual villains on the show, that would be a question for them because maybe they are being told. But in my position, I was never confronted to say, hey, do this or say that or go to that person and do this. I I don't even think that they would come at me that way because they knew what type of person I was. And maybe that was also my gift and my curse, you mm -hmm. know? So, you know, we got to get out that whole crabs in the pot mentality. And I think that that involves society. I think that also involves just black people in general. And I really want us to be able to do better. We can, we can lift each other up. Why can't we be that race of people who actually build each other up? Yeah. We see other people do it all the time, but yet it's us that will tear each other down. This show could have been an amazing show had we all been on the same page and said, let's get this money together. You know, let's Friends go style. ahead and let's go ahead and argue and pick at each other. But there's certain boundaries that shouldn't be crossed. Right. You know, so to me, when you get to a level of just disgust and hate, that's when things take a turn. Mm. And that is also what let me know that it was my time to go as well. Mm. Cause I said, okay, this isn't fun anymore. This isn't like a situation of, all right, we're on this platform, let's use it. Let's benefit from it. And let's encourage each other. Mm. What drew me to the Housewives franchise from the very beginning was the fact that there was a level of sisterhood. There were women who weren't really known women. Maybe their husbands were known. And all of a sudden they are superstars. People know them, their household names. They're building businesses. They're showing people what I'm really capable of doing. And that's what I loved about Housewives. When I came on board, I was all about the sisterhood. I would promote everybody. You know, I'm gonna show up at all your events and I'm gonna buy something. Don't give me anything for free. I'm gonna pay for it and I'm gonna show you my support. Um, I'm gonna post you on social media. That's what I thought it was supposed to be about, you know? So when I started seeing things kind of like drift away from that, I was like, wow, this isn't what I signed up for. This isn't what I thought it was supposed to be. Mm. And here we are. Now that you're able to sort of write your own story and you wrote it in three parts, can you differentiate part one, part two, and part three for us? Yes, it's a natural progression. So part one just kind of lays the tone. But then I give you some deep little nuggets in there. And for people who listen to part one, listen to it again and take housewives out of the perspective, mm. especially when you get to the part after I introduce the gatekeeper. Take housewives out of the perspective. You know, people want a seat at the table. I talk about that in part one. You know, who's really getting a seat at the table? Truth be told, our kind's reserved for the stable. Mm. Where did it, where's the stable at? Outside, the horses live in there. 
That's what really is going down in our society. We're reserved for outside. We can't even get in the door. Talk about a seat at the table. So what are we supposed to do to get to that seat? Most times people are so programmed that they want to be a part that they will sell their souls and do anything to get there. Then once they get there, they realize, whoa, I'm not even inside the house. <laughs> I'm still outside. I'm out here at a darn barn table. <laughs> like I haven't even gotten my foot in the door. You're fooled. I pay for the production of By The Time. I helped produce it. Uh, well, I did produce it. I helped edit it. Um, my brother and I were the creative directors in it. My videographer, he, he did his thing with the visuals and then with the editing as well. All the music I chose, you know, so at the end of the day, if I can do this for the rest of my life, I'm happy with it. Whether it blows up and becomes some great next level thing and opportunities blossom from it, great. If they don't, I'm still fine. I'm happy. Me and Eve Essentials, make sure y'all shop. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of the cinematography, it it it's almost it's I told you before, it's Lord of the Rings. It's um mm -hmm. it is Game, Game of, of Thrones. Thrones. Were those the influences that you were going for when you developed this? Or did that just evolve? I was going to just sit down in front of this fire and I was actually gonna recreate my reunion outfit. The whole look, I was gonna wear the dress, I was gonna have the, the hair and everything and recreate the whole look and have the binder. But then I realized how cold it is outside and I said, I ain't doing that. <laughs> so I scratched that, I talked to my glam, I talked to my hairstylist and I said, I really want something that's like, I wanted to remind people of my first time being on Potomac mm. with a little twist. My first time. My first all cast was high tea. And I had the I little remember. two buns here, which I had a hat on and the hat was like made to go with the, the hair. And then I was asked to take my hat off. I was so irritated at that high tea, yeah. I wasn't supposed to be without a hat. We were all wearing hats that day. So that was the theme, come to high tea with the hat on. My hat was too big so they couldn't see my face so they told me to take it off. And I'm gotcha. like, whoa, my hair is styled for the hat. So whatever, I keep moving. I was called Princess Leia. So I said, you know what? I want to do a Princess Leia look, but Afrocentric. Okay. So we started out and we did the two buns. Then as I'm watching her, because I wanted the braid down the middle to look like one of my old confessional looks that I did in season three. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, season four. And I said, you know what? What if we put a bun in the middle too? We literally just kind of made it up as we went along. And that was the day and we shot it and things just happened. I said, well, it's cold outside. I'm going to throw my fur on. This way I don't have to worry about what I have on. I'm gonna just throw some knee boots on, black pants, throw on the fur. It was freezing cold. It was raining and snowing. And the, uh, because the moisture was in the air, it kept turning the fire into smoke. The ash was blowing right in my face. It was windy as I don't know what. Um, we have behind the scenes clips where you can like literally see me like holding up the binder, protecting my face. <laughs> and then certain takes, you'll see that the binder was literally falling apart. Some of the tabs got so wet that they started uh, ripping. So it was like a whole hot mess. And most of when I was reading from the book, I had to go off memory because the pages were getting wet. So I couldn't read all of the ink. So it was like a whole situation. <laughs> the chef retired her pot. Woo! The smoke just burned the crap out of my eyes. Okay, it's starting to calm down. Okay, I'll do it again. <laughs> this rain needs to go away. <laughs> my pages are starting to stick. The binder's getting ruined. Well, I just printed it. All right, hopefully this one I don't mess up because this one I just wrote. Okay. Gather around the fire, boss squad. I have a story to share. No, that's not what I'm saying. Gather around the fire, boss squad. I, ooh. Uh, wait for it to stop blowing in my direction. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, okay. Well, that, those parts where I kind of paused, will you be able to edit it so that it flows a little smoother or? Okay, good, all right. I wish this phone would stop moving. Let's see if that works. All right. I'll start back from what here's a thought, just to be safe. It looks great, baby. It, it paid off. We're good? Okay. Okay, so 
you do that and you, you're editing it and you're putting it together. And this maybe this is just between all of us in this room or the people who actually <laughs> watch it. You can choose whether or not. To, was there anything that you put in there initially and then took out? Everything is as it is. And we actually came back for a second day of filming. So after we did the first shot, it was, remind you, it was so cold, it was rainy. I just wanted to get these lines done mm -hmm. and get back in the house to some warmth, right? So I get the first edit back and it was just me sitting in front of the fire. And I was just like, shoot, I totally forgot about B-roll. Like I totally forgot about all of the intricate details. So I sent it to my brother and I was like, it needs something. He said, well, first of all, you need some type of visuals. We need some characters. He said, get your animation guy. Let's get him involved as well. So I was like, okay. So we started coming up with a plan. My brother went through the entire video, the whole script, and he actually came up with, insert this image here. Let me see images of this person here. Let me see you. It was all his idea. He said, I need to see you walking out. He said, when you first start off, I don't want to just see you in the chair reading. He said, I want you to be reading, but I want you walking in. He said, when you light the match, I want to see you light the match. So you know how you get those real long matchsticks? Yeah. The bottom of the box is where you strike it. I tore the bottom of the box off and I put it in my glove. When I first struck the match, it looks like it's like coming out my hand. So that I just came up with while we were like out there. Me and Dexter were out there and I just was like, Shh. I was like, oh, that looks cool. And I had to do several takes of it to make sure it looked good. Go ahead and do a uh, test pour. Oh, that works. Action. All right, cut. Do, uh, go ahead, do the motion again. Let me see where you're going. Right, right, right by there? Okay. All right, hold on one second. If you, you know, we could back up back just right here. Take one step back right there, right there. Okay. And do it from there. All right. Ready? Yep. All right, action. And cut it. Let me do it one more time. Um, so my brother went through the whole detail and said, I want to see you strike the match. I want to see you hold the, the match to the um, you know, to the to the the logs, and I want to see the fire catch. I want to see you land the logs. I want to see every little detail. So we had to do a whole nother day of shooting. We probably spent a good four hours and we just did everything we could think of from sitting in the chair, opening the book, close the book, open the book, close the book, get up from the chair, place the book, place the book from the left, place the book from the right. We literally did every single thing that we could think of. Shots of the fire, shots of the log, shots of me leaving, shots of me going and coming and everything. Then um, it was nice because he he was able to give us a template of what we need to see for each part. So even when you watch part three and I start out and I'm already sitting at the fire, you'll notice after each part, I walk away after part one. Part two, the book is still sitting there. Mm. So you see the book and then you see me coming back. And now, because normally what fires do is they start to wither, I had a bottle of lighter fluid and I'm spraying the lighter fluid as I walk by. And that was a cool entrance for part two. <laughs> part three, again, the book is sitting there. So when I start part three, I've already walked in for part two. So mm -hmm. part three, I'm sitting, I'm looking at the fire, I'm admiring it. There's some logs sitting in front of me. I'm placing them in. I get up, I head to the book, I open it up. You know, it was so much of those details that my that was all my brother's ideas. The Thank amount you. of detail that went into each little thing each little clip each little scene i felt like it was this is what you see on a television or a movie production or a music video so yes kudos to you guys for that yes. <laughs> is there anything in part three that may shock people i know you gave us a little bit of a teaser earlier but i'm asking yeah. for another one because we did this project some people thought it came a little too late but there's a bigger picture for me mm. because I know how creative I can be. My team is amazing. And if any opportunity pops up, then we're ready, you know? So this is just the beginning of doors opening and you never know where this could lead. Uh, looking back on your time on the show, looking back on your experiences with the ladies, and I think this would be a good question to ask you now, several months after you've left. And then I hope maybe another time we ask a year or two in the future. 
what would you say or what your final thoughts about the ladies as they move forward? I know some people say, oh, well, it's what you signed up for. Yeah, I definitely did. I know what rights I gave away in order to be on the platform. And I was smart enough to use the platform to my benefit as much as possible. But at the end of the day, you have to also know what your boundaries are. Mm. What are your limits? If you're starting to cross certain boundaries, that's when your integrity needs to kick in and you say, you know what, this is too much for me, let me walk away. If you cross that line, there's no going back. Mm. And that to me, my family, my marriage, there's no going back. There's no line I'm gonna cross that's gonna sacrifice the love and the protection that I have for my family. And when you get to that point, that's when you're letting everybody know where you stand. Yeah. So they know your limits. So if they keep pressing those little buttons and they keep pushing those little limits, they're seeing what your reaction's gonna be. And if your reaction is what they expect it to be and they think that, oh, I can do whatever I want to you, they're gonna do whatever they want to you. It's never gonna end. So I would say just be careful, you know, choose your poison and just make sure that you know what the consequences are gonna be. Now, while I'm grateful for this platform that they barely let me use, um, I'm grateful that I was able to start a successful business such as Mila Eve and have the fan base or the support base rather, not even, I hate saying fan, um, the support that I have and to have people that support me just because they support me in the Samuels family means the world. Yeah. They will buy from me having no knowledge of essential oils just because they appreciate what I was able to bring them when I was on TV weekly for them. And to me, I'm grateful for that and that's why I'm here. There's no reason to do reality TV if you don't have something to push mm. outside of yourself. And let it be something that helps people, please. Um, these people that try to start these little one-off businesses and then, you know, we all saw what happened once the quarantine happened. Everybody that had a business that was from out of a whole nother country or a whole nother continent, they businesses tank. They couldn't get the products and that's where they still are, you know? So it's like, you, you can't have these get rich quick schemes. Mm. It has to be something that you're truly passionate about, something that you are knowledgeable of, and something that helps people. Cause that's why we're here at the end of the day. We're here to help when we're put on these platforms. And that has been my mindset and that continues to be my mindset. And I'm just grateful for the next level that God is taking me on. You summed that up perfectly. <laughs> I can't even end this on a better note than that. Thank you for sharing all the behind the scenes tea Thank of you. Binder Time stories. I'm your boy DJ Richie Scott. I'm sitting here with Monique Samuels. <laughs> but until next time, we'll see you guys later.